Okay, everyone, uh, welcome to Does OER Make Your Heart Race? My name is Ann Tangland. I'm the director of the library at St. Bonaventure University, an affiliate member of SUNY Law, and I will be the moderator for this session. As a reminder, the session is being recorded and it will be posted along with slides from the session. Chat can be used for discussion during the presentation. Please be sure to set your chat to go to all panelists and attendees if you want your message to be seen by everyone here this afternoon. And we have 3940 attendees right now. So this is great. Thanks for coming. Please use the Q&A option for questions. Our presenters will address questions at the end of the session. And they have also asked me for a verbal time alert at 4.45 p.m. So housekeeping issues aside, I would like to welcome you to the session and introduce our two presenters. Uh, first, we have Michelle Beachy from Monroe Community College, where she is the Access Services and OER Librarian. Her priorities include supporting the Access Services team and their efforts to provide exceptional service to students, as well as leading the Campus OER initiative. She holds a BA in French from the College of Brockport, State University of New York, and an MILS from the University at Buffalo. We also have with us today Laura Harris from SUNY Oswego, where she is the Distance and Open Education Librarian. She holds an MSI with a specialization in Library and Information Services and an MS in Curriculum Development and Instructional Technology. In addition to supporting online and distance learning, she serves as a campus leader in promoting OER initiatives. So with no further ado, it is my pleasure to turn the session over to Michelle and Laura. Thank you, Anne. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, again, you're, we're going to be talking about does OER make your heart race? And I guess you can think that making your heart race in a really good, exciting way or in an anxious way. Um, and we hope that we're going to soothe your anxiety a little bit. Um, whether you've worked with OER or you haven't before, um, we're going to give you some tools to help you um, do your best if you're connected with it already or not. Um, so uh, both Laura and I are OER leads on our campus. Um, and we know each other via the SUNY OER Leads group, which meets um, virtually regularly. We talk about different projects, what's going on on campuses, different open initiatives. Um, and Laura had posted on the Facebook Workplace OER page uh, group that she was looking to collaborate in a presentation about OER resources. Um, and we connected because I was starting uh, work on an OER toolkit for librarians. Um, so it, within the slides, there are some um, links. And again, as Anne said, those will, uh, the slides will be posted on the conference page. Um, but at the end, I'll, I'll just put the link to the OER toolkit in the chat for you so you can take a look at that um, at your leisure. All right, so um, we're gonna talk a little bit about an OER definition. Um, if you're not familiar with what open educational resources are um, or just a general refresher. Um, we're going to talk about why OER is important, whether it's part of your work or not. Um, you're going to have the OER toolkit for librarians be launched right to you. You'll be the first group to be able to see it um, and critique it for me. Let me know suggestions that you, uh, you might like to see in there as well. We'll give you some more resources um, in your journey with open and um, then we'll just wrap up at the end with some questions and conversation. So first off, um, a definition of OER from Creative Commons. There's a lot of different, um, there's some variations of a definition of OER, but they generally are, um, have the same uh, focus, just different type of wording. So Creative Commons uh, defines uh, open educational resources as teaching, learning, and research materials that are either within the public domain or licensed in a manner that provides everyone with free and perpetual permission to engage in the 5R activities. And what are the 5R activities, you ask? Um, the 5Rs are, um, with that OER, um, you can retain it, so you can make it, you keep it, you use it for yourself. Um, you can uh, reuse your original that you've revised or remixed um, and share that publicly. Uh, you can revise it, change it, adapt it, modify it. Um, you can remix it, combining your original or revised copy with uh, any other material to create something completely new. Um, and you can redistribute it, sharing copies of that original revised or remixed copy of the resource with anyone else. 
Um, so our biggest focus really as librarians should be on student success, right? We want to know how we can help students do well to pass their courses um, and eventually get their degree or their certificate or transfer to another school. Um, and OER provides benefits to both students and faculty that uh, will help increase student success and completion. Um, so on your own campus, you may have an OER librarian um, that works with OER. Um, if you're lucky, you have a full-time OER librarian. Some of us are half-time OER librarians, or you at least have someone who's an OER lead on your campus. Um, and that OER librarian or OER lead is also doing um, some advocacy. They're liaising between outside groups and faculty, um, groups like SUNY OER Services or Lumen Learning who partners with us. Um, they might be facilitating workshops, meeting with administration, uh, board of trustees, student government and other stakeholders. Um, they're staying current with OER sources um, and many other things and they need some help to sustain OER on your campus. We all know one person can't do everything. Um, so they need you to talk up OER with your faculty and departments. Um, as a liaison, you have connections within departments. And if you don't have a liaison area, you probably partner with some people on campus, different areas with events and workshops. If you teach information literacy, um, you know people around campus. Um, so as librarians, we're information providers. Um, and that's what we're doing with OER. We're providing information um, that's open to faculty. Um, so, okay, you're saying, well, OER is not part of my job responsibility. Why would I need to know about it? That's what your OER expert on campus um, should be a, a, an expert in and, and be familiar with. Um, but as for those reasons that I mentioned, it's helpful to have someone to work with um, and help you get the word out about OER. So let's look at why it is important for student success. Um, there's definitely a cost savings. That is one that is usually forefront with everyone when you think about, oh, textbooks are so expensive. So obviously we're saving students and with that savings, they may be able to take extra courses. They may be able to afford materials for another class that doesn't have open materials. Um, they, we did uh, a few years ago at Monroe, we did a kind of question students like what what would you do or the people that took open courses you know what did you do with that extra money that you didn't have to spend on textbooks and things ranged from you know I took my daughter out to dinner which is so sweet um, to I was able to take another class I could pay my rent I could put gas in my car um, so um, the cost saving is definitely important for students um, it's an equity issue um, we see it all the time uh, on our campuses where we have our reserve collection, you know, students that maybe can't afford the textbook, now they have to find some way to get to campus, um, to get to the library, to get to that material. OER provides that material for them without having to worry about how they're going to get to it. Um, as far as accessibility, we have two different um, ways to look at accessibility. We can talk about the, the access um, right away to the material. Um, you know, before a class even starts, students will have the, the materials ready. They don't have to wait until their financial aid comes in or till they get paid in two weeks when they're already behind in their class. Um, they have immediate access to the class materials. Um, the other side of accessibility is for any students that have that need to modify the way their their learning style is um, looking at the, the you know, if they have a visual impairment and they need to enlarge the material if it's an electronic resource it's so much easier for them to just do that on a screen than to try to you know, work with the pages of a textbook. They can manipulate the, the material as they need to. Um, the faculty can customize their course materials. So um, if they want to uh, supply students with a um, commercial publisher textbook, they're getting whatever's in there whatever photos are in there. If that doesn't look like their student body, oh well, that's what they get. With OER, they can change out photos. They can um, change names of, um, if there's a, a narrative about different people, they can put some names in there that are familiar to students. Um, I know there's one, I can't remember if it's in the uh, Western area of the United States or if it was up in British Columbia where there's a large indigenous population. And there was a faculty that developed a textbook and everything in there was relevant to their culture. So it was really understandable and relatable for the students. 
um, which makes it easier for them to learn if, uh, if they're familiar with, with um, the faces and the names. Uh, Just to add to what uh, Michelle is saying, uh, because you can edit the materials on the fly, it's also going to be more timely. Um, for example, people can go in and modify materials to talk about COVID-19 right now, whereas, as we all know from the publishing life cycle, um, it's probably going to take quite a while longer for textbooks and um, reference materials to have that information. Excellent point, Laura. Um, one um, other thing that I learned recently is that when it comes to materials for visually impaired uh, learners, that the uh, accessible versions for them are often uh, in addition behind. So that would be another benefit uh, accessibility wise to OER research. Thanks, Laura. Um, so also, uh, OER is more than just textbooks. You know, there are open materials, like you could have a whole course that's ready to go. Your, my PowerPoint is openly licensed. If someone wants to take my PowerPoint and use it, um, they can. Um, there are, you know, lab materials um, and homework managers that are all open. When you hear students paying about paying for um, like a math lab access and there's a free version, it makes me cringe <laughs> because there's no need for them to pay. I had to pay for my own sons <laughs> because there was not an open version that the teacher was using. There was one available, but the teacher wasn't using it. Um, so there's more than just textbooks available. Um, and open pedagogy is an excellent use of OER. Um, Laura's going to talk about that a little bit later um, when we get dig into the toolkit and I show you some of that. Um, but uh, open pedagogy is another way that makes learning a lot more relevant for students when they have ownership of the material and know that it's not a throwaway assignment necessarily. Um, they, they feel uh, like it's more worth it, the work that they put in, that they're recognized for that. All right, so um, what was my motivation for deciding to create an OER toolkit? Um, so back in uh, 2017, I started at Monroe as the project manager for the Achieving the Dream grant degree initiative. And I had zero knowledge of OER. I knew nothing about it, no idea. It was like, okay, sure, I can manage this project. You know, a project manager, you jump in and you don't necessarily have to know what it is, but um, it really helped to be able to know what was going on and, and how to work with things. And being a, um, a librarian, working with this team who was already developed uh, at Monroe, an excellent team of three librarians and an instructional designer, um, they were affectionately known as the OER dream team on campus, um, but they also had other responsibilities. One was the library director, one was instructional technologies librarian, you know, instructional designer, they have things to do. So I really felt like a big pain <laughs> every time I had a question. And if you've done any work with OER, you know that you're going to have a lot of questions. Um, so I kept thinking, is there somewhere that I can just get some of this information where I don't have to constantly ask you? Um, you know, I really wished for some place that I could learn about OER and just figure out how to do OER. Like, there's got to be something. And I think there probably were some toolkit-ish things that were out then. You know, that was a few years ago. Um, so I had no knowledge of OER. And there's so much information, so many listservs. It was just like my head was going to explode with all this was going on. So uh, I did learn a lot really quickly, um, and I still feel like I don't know a lot uh, related to OER, but um, you kind of get your feet to the fire and you just have to do it. Um, but uh, in between, I um, was hired with SUNY OER Services, um, may have worked with some of you who might be uh, attending right now. Um, and I saw this uh, call for um, SPARC Open Education Leadership Program. If you're not familiar with SPARC, um, that's an acronym for Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resources Coalition. Um, and this program uh, develops leaders in the open education movement, um, helps you develop as a leader, you, get a, you, you gain a network of like-minded colleagues, um, as they call it, it's a vibrant community of practice. So people who are interested in open education um, and how to advance that initiative. 
Um, so I saw that and I said, you know what, I've been thinking about, it would be great to have some something, some sort of resource. I could, through this program, um, you work through once, uh, it was last fall when I started it, um, you work through a semester of learning about open and um, doing kind of like almost small assignments to lead up to in the spring, you uh, work on a project, uh, your capstone project. So um, as I started that program uh, last fall is when I was hired at Monroe as the um, access services and OER librarian. So my original focus for the toolkit was to have something available for SUNY librarians, everyone. I would just roll it out to everyone to start with. Um, when I got hired at Monroe, I said, all right, well, this makes a little more sense. I can focus on one campus. What, what are the needs there? And um, then it can be shared with everyone. So we're now at the sharing point where I can roll it out to everybody and I'm excited to have uh, people take a look at it. All right, so I do have listed on there as well. Um, the leadership program for next year's cohort the applications are due tomorrow. So if you're interested, you're really gonna have to get your application in, um, but you could contact them if you're interested in the program as well. It's an awesome program. All right, so um, we're gonna delve into the toolkit. And as I said in the beginning, you'll have the link to go through, I, as I was saying to Laura earlier, this is kind of like speed dating with OER, if anyone still does speed dating. Um, because I'm just going to fly through the, the toolkit and then you can take a look at it um, at your leisure. But we'll, uh, we'll jump into it right now. Um, I should say too, before we jump into it, um, you know, it's a whole process when you're creating a thing, like how do I want it to look? What do I, you know, it sounds great. Like I'm going to make this toolkit. And then as I got started on the project, it was um, a little bit of well now how what am i how am i going to build this thing what am i going to do with it so i decided the easiest thing to do to start with was to create a um a google doc you know it's in my in my google drive of chapters so this right now is really just all separate docs um they're really simple to get through um, eventually it may end up a press book um probably more likely it might be a lib guide uh, I'm not quite sure, but this, the way I have it now is easily shareable and it's easily adaptable for anyone who wants to use any part of it. So um, I'll just preface it with that. Oops, I didn't want to go there, sorry. And while Michelle is um, bringing that up, I am going to be jumping in at various points, so I'm unmuting myself. Um, just wanted to let you guys know if you hear anything in the background, my air conditioner. <laughs> so. Yeah, and air conditioning is essential, so. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, it looks like this in my drive. So I have everything, you know, all the chapters. These are the topics that I thought would be um, relevant and, and would work at my institution. If you choose to use it at your institution, obviously you change it up however you want to. Everything's openly licensed. Um, so I have 10 chapters. Um, I'm going to skip the acknowledgments section at the end because like a good OER, it's in progress. Um, and I really wanted to do a lot of reflection to include in the acknowledgements. Um, we just finished up the program last week. So I'm, I'm still working on that. Uh, so to start off, I just have an introduction. You know, this is for my campus, um, for librarians who may not work with OER, and a little explanation about what it is. I emphasize quite a bit. Of course, you'll always have your friendly OER librarian to help you. You're not being thrown to the wolves and say, here, liaisons, go out and you know, have OER all over our campus. Um, so uh, as I said, it's all shareable, changeable, if you choose to use it however you'd like at your own campus. So the first chapter, uh, learning about open education and OER. If you don't know anything, great. Here's a, an expansive topic. Here are a few of the basics. So sometimes I give just a description, like what is open education? Here's the definition. Um, definition from uh, Creative Commons, the one that I just read to you at the beginning, it's all here. And then there's a video. Um, this is actually Abby Elder, who is the open access librarian at Iowa State, and she was um, in the Spark Open Education Leadership Program last year. So for her capstone, she created this wonderful series of videos. So here's one, an intro to open educational resources. Less than four minutes. Four minutes of your life and you're gonna have it, you'll be good. 
Um, and then SUNY OER Services has an OER community course. If you don't know about that, you should. It's been around for a couple of years. So there's a series of modules, understanding OER. Go through the module and you're gonna learn about OER. OpenStax is an excellent um, uh, source for OER. They have um, a complete course in OER with, through this text, a video about why open education matters. So here we go. That's it for chapter one. Nice and, and easy to digest. Um, we talk about copyright and creative commons licensing. I guess if you're a copyright librarian or lawyer, you're, you're super versed in it. I, I don't know, I'm always confused. There's just too much changing or going on or I don't know. So here it is, um, you know, about copyright and creative commons. If you don't know about creative commons, here's an easy way to learn about it. Um, we've got a video, um, there's the Creative Commons website, um, Creative Commons for educators and librarians. Laura, take it away. Yes, so um, the Creative Commons for educators and librarians, uh, it is openly licensed, so you don't have to be part of the course to uh, read these materials, but uh, the Creative Commons does offer a 10 week course um, on the Creative Commons and uh, I actually completed it last summer and I found it incredibly useful. Um, some of it was old hat to me, but I've been aware of Creative Commons since like the mid 2000s. So um, it's not <laughs> terribly surprising, but even so I still found it very useful. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I'm not sure of what the cost was. It uh, kind of uh, fell into my lap. We had uh, members of our campus technology services had signed up for it and not everyone had realized the time commitment. So they contacted the library and said, would any of you be interested in taking our spot? So um, myself and um, my colleague Deb Bowder uh, were able to take the course without really having to uh, pay or do anything like that. So that was to you, Michelle. <laughs> Um, and, <clears throat> excuse me, if you've done any work with <clears throat> Creative Commons open licensing, you may have seen like the symbols. I know faculty always get really confused about all these, what does this mean? CC by NC, ND, what is all this stuff? So right on this page, there's also um, a nice graphic where if you're like, oh my gosh, I have to meet with faculty and they're gonna, they ask me about this. Here you go. It's, here's a nice um, graphic from them, one here. And then here's a chart that kind of shows you like, okay, Here's the license, here's the description, what can you do? Basic, you know, it, again, if you're not used to working with it and you're not familiar with what are all these symbols, it's all, it's all here for you right here. Okay, so there's our copyright and Creative Commons. Um, open pedagogy. So there's some information here about what open pedagogy is. Um, there's a video from a faculty at UB talking about creating an open textbook. Um, Robin DeRosa, if you do any work related to open, you probably know of her. She's got a great, um, <clears throat> using open pedagogy, she's got a great um, uh, spot in her blog where she talks about it. Um, Rajiv Jangani also, if you do any open work, you'll see him a lot. Um, why have students answer questions when they can write them? So ways you can use students to help uh, within a class and Laura has a great example. Yeah, so Michelle was saying earlier that one of the points of open pedagogy is that you're not creating uh, these disposable assignments that students don't find useful. You're trying to do something that's um, a more authentic learning experience. Um, and I can give you an example. Uh, when I was in my master's program at Albany, um, one of my courses uh, had us creating basically a wiki glossary and it was within Blackboard and it may have been a useful tool, but it was only useful for our class. Um, and maybe having something like that freely uh, available on the web would have felt more, more useful and less like busy work. Um, so that's one of the underpinnings of open pedagogy. Um, I have had the uh, pleasure of working on an open pedagogy project uh, with a uh, a theater faculty member at SUNY Oswego. Uh, she had envisioned a um, database of Shakespearean monologues. Uh, and there are a few sources for Shakespearean monologues out there, um, but none of them have the detail that she really wanted. Um, 
So uh, if you could go to just any, any of these categories on the left and let's do um, hero. So we have a character description um, and uh, I learned about some things like what a scored monologue is. Basically, it's telling you where the beats are, um, you know, where you put the emphasis. And then um, to help people understand, because as we know, uh, Shakespeare is not always uh, comprehensible to the average person. Uh, there's uh, basically the meaning of the beat, and the beat is a section. Um, so there are all these sort of additional tools to help people understand, um, to understand the monologue they're reading. Um, we have a glossary and that was actually a lot of fun um, and a lot of trouble because we were trying to get permission from the OED to use their definitions and every attempt I made uh, just sort of went into this black hole. Um, so we ended up using some openly licensed uh, older materials, but we also got permission from uh, a site called Shakespeare's Words to use their definitions as well. Um, so that was a little interesting. And for those of you who are looking at the URL, you may see that it has a familiar URL, <laughs> uh, LibGuides. And that, um, that was basically my idea. I had sat down with the, with the theater professor and uh, said, you know, what do you want this to look like? And I had a, a big whiteboard in my office. So, you know, I was drawing things as she was describing that. And, you know, I started thinking what technology uh, could help us with this. And, you know, I thought of WordPress because WordPress is what um, is the basis of press books and I believe Lumen Learning as well. Um, so, you know, it's kind of a, a strong platform for OER, um, but I thought, Lip guides might work as well. I mean, I was thinking of it particularly from the metadata aspect um, because there are these different ways you can add metadata within LibGuides. And um, I worked at SpringShare for five years and um, the CEO actually uh, gave us this site um, uh, at no cost for this project. Um, so that was, uh, a great option for us. And because I had worked there um, and because I have continued to be the LibGuides administrator at Oswego, I have a lot of familiarity with the system. So I was able to bring that knowledge um, and experience to uh, helping the professor create these materials with her students. Um, so for the last few semesters, I've gone in uh, and worked with her students in uh, showing them how to use LibGuides. Um, obviously, I'm not showing them every single thing in LibGuides, but I am trying to, I, and I have written up documentation for them, um, and I, I have explained, I'm like, this software was not really built for you guys, it's built for librarians, so I'm going to focus on just the things you need to be aware of for this assignment. Um, and of course, I've updated that uh, as semesters have gone on. And um, I think this is an interesting example. Um, and I think there are other technology inclined librarians who may have ideas about um, platforms uh, that can be used for open pedagogy projects. Um, so even if you are not uh, versed in OER, if you feel comfortable with technology, you may be able to um, offer some insight for this kind of thing. Back to you, Michelle. Thanks, Laura. And that if you attended the keynote this morning with Katrina, um, one of the things that I took away from there when she was talking about um, using creativity is making her work visible. And this is a great way to make librarians work visible. You know, you, you're partnering and putting together that amazing um, resource and, you know, collaborating with students and faculty. It's awesome. So there's a great example of open pedagogy. Um, and we'll jump over to our next chapter is accessibility. Um, so this is kind of a, a maybe more of a focus if you have faculty who are creating OER, but definitely even if you're using OER, you should be verifying that um, it meets the accessibility standards. Well, where do I find the accessibility standards? Um, there's some here, great resources here. The BC campus, again, up in Canada, they have a wonderful accessibility toolkit. 
it's all there for you. Um, SUNY OER Services has an accessibility checklist, so you can go through the material and make sure things are accessible. Um, Open Washington has an accessibility module, um, which gives you the um, web content accessibility guidelines. Um, you might work with faculty who aren't aware of the ability to search YouTube for videos with captions. I think most of us as librarians know how to do that, but here's a, an easy way to just send off and say, here you go, here's how you, how you, how you search. And making PDFs accessible, like that's definitely useful for all of us. Um, any way you look at it. Um, I wanted to add a bit to the uh, accessibility comment. Um, one of the other benefits of the Creative Commons licensing is, um, and this is something I learned from the certificate course, <laughs> um, is that the Creative Commons licenses explicitly allow for changing the format of um, something licensed with a Creative Commons license. Um, so if you wanted to make like an audio version of something that's in text, and let's say that it has a uh, Creative Commons non-derivative license on it, uh, which means you can't make changes. Uh, the format changes is actually are explicitly allowed. So even if you are working with something that says, oh, you can't edit this, you still um, are permitted to make, uh, turn it into a different format. Um, and I think that's really um, a huge advantage for uh, accessibility because it gives you that permission um, to work quickly to change the format if you need to. You don't have to go through the process of uh, asking for permission. Um, and I talked about um, OER communities. I talked about a little bit about my small community at Monroe, um, which you learn how wonderful the open community is and share. So we have a lar our larger community. I talked about how Laura and I know each other through our OER leads group. And then there are many large uh, communities um, across the world. These are a few that are um, really helpful. Um, SUNY OER services, obviously right here within SUNY. Um, the SUNY OER Workplace Facebook group, which again is where Laura and I connected. Um, the Rebus community is wonderful. Spark, which I talked about. Um, I threw in eCampus Ontario since they're right over the lake um, and they have a great group. And a really, really wonderful re resource is this um, Community College Consortium for OER, CCC OER. Um, they have a really active um, Google group that you can join because who doesn't want to be on another listserv, right? You can get all that information, but you can also just access the information as well without being on the listserv. Um, but you'll find when there's someone that's looking for something so off the wall and you're like, I can't imagine anyone has ever heard of this topic and you throw it out there and someone um, says, hey, I know who to connect you with. It's wonderful. Um, and they also have, uh, CCC OER also has a, a great um, archive of webinars about just about anything related to OER. Um, let's see. Problem of when you have your screen shared and you try to go to the top, you can't get there. All right, there we go. Um, my next chapter is a little bit about OER initiatives right at MCC. So obviously on your campus, you wouldn't have something like this, but it talks about the objective of our, of our project, um, what our goals are, and um, you know, what's important to the program. This is great when your provost or your VP or your director says, hey, I need something really quick about what's going on um, on campus with OER. And then you're like, okay, here we go. I've got, you know, this is our, our what we're looking at. Um, this gives you all the information about um, some of the grants that we've worked on and um, development that we've done. Um, we just com completed the first year of the SUNY OER Services Sustainability Program. Um, so doing this toolkit is definitely going to add, I'm hoping, I'm assuming, to our sustainability because we want to keep the program strong and um, robust. And uh, I hope in this section to um, put together one of my, my goals is to put together a listing of all of our courses. I've seen other campuses that have great LibGuides with um, you know, listing all the people who have developed courses, what the courses are, links right to them. So I'm hoping to be able to attach that to this section as well um, so people can see what is going on right on our campus. Um, oops, did I just unshare? You did. did. <laughs> and Michelle, um, you skipped over, I think, the finding images. I did. 
Thank you. Let me get back to sharing. And I know that because Naomi had mentioned one of the things that's on that page. So. <laughs> yeah, there it is. Okay, it's hiding under that little bar. Okay, so open images, you know, you're always looking for something to use and you're like, oh darn, it's copyrighted, I can't use it. So, you know, you know the basic ones probably like Unsplash or Flickr. Um, if people need to know how to do a Google search for graphics with a, with a Creative Commons license, you can use Creative Commons for a search. Um, and then there are some really um, unique ones that you may be looking for and you're like, I have no idea where to find these things. There's a gender spectrum collection. Um, there's a woman of color in tech. Um, and we just added this one. Laura is helping me add on to my, um, my listing here of Nappy, which are people of color. Um, you know, as I said, we want to customize things and make it make people see themselves, students see themselves in the material that they're using. Um, so this is a, a very short listing of what you can find out there um, for open images. There are a lot more than that. Uh, I'm going to jump to, okay, we have a listing of some additional resources and readings, you know, like if you just can't get enough, you want to know more. Um, these again are really, they're not anything that's going to make your head explode. Um, they're informational, but you know, if you want to know more, um, which is, is great, it's, it's going to help your students and your faculty. Uh, and uh, here are some of those, there's a course, um, this was funded by the Libraries Open Education Leader Grant. Um, it's a couple of years old, still relevant. Um, OE Global is a great community of organizations um, that are, are fostering more open development as well. Um, OER, a field guide for academic librarians, gives you some more information. Open Education Reader by David Wiley, who is um, a huge name in the, in the OER world. Um, the CARE Framework, it gives you the shared values and collective vision for um, you know, use of, of open. Uh, BC Campus, again, they've got some gu guides and toolkits that are for, um, you know, there's some for students, some for faculty, some for librarians. Um, and then again, back to Abby Elder, who's one of the um, people who also did the same SPARK program, her capstone project. Um, she created this OER starter kit for instructors. So that's something you could share if you have someone who's looking to create OER, if you have faculty that's looking to create OER. Um, and the last section, um, which I'm not going to even show you because it's completely blank. As I said, my acknowledgments at the end, um, I will be working to put some of my own reflection in that on the project um, as a whole and, and how I created it and came about with it. Um, so that ends our talking at you section. And I hope we have some questions and conversation. Um, I also have our, both of our emails there. Oh, I'm going to put the um, link to the LibGuide or to the toolkit in the chat as well. So if you want to take a look at it yourselves, you can do that. Well, thank you, Michelle and Laura. In fact, Michelle, you are answering one of the questions on the list right now. Yes. Was what the URL was to get to that tremendous toolkit. I'm psychic. <laughs> oh, thank you. That was very informative. We do have a couple of other questions in the Q&A. And uh, just a reminder to everyone, if you do have more questions, please post them there. And we will start getting our answers right now. Um, one uh, question is from Allison, and she asks, if OER materials are so editable, how can we be sure that they receive proper oversight and are properly peer reviewed? That is a great question. Um, there are some OER that are um, peer reviewed that you will know, like OpenStax is a place where you know you can get material and it's peer reviewed. Um, other things people like, you know, I just put my presentation together and it's gonna be out there in the open world. Um, what happens is people who are experts are gonna look at it and go, oh, wait, that's not, that's not right. That's not, you know, like if it's your subject matter, you should know. I always say if someone comes to me and they're like, okay, I need, um, I needed to find an OER on 19th century Argentinian architecture or something. You know, I'm like, I don't know anything about that, but I've just found all this stuff. Let me give it to you because you're the expert. And if you know, you want to use it for your class, you're going to look at it and say, this is not good at all. Um, and it's just like anything else you might find, like, you know, on, on the internet, you're like, well, things are misspelled and the, you know, the fonts are all over the place and it's disorganized. It's probably not the greatest resource. Um, and if someone is concerned about, whether it is quality or not. There are rubrics as well. 
that you can kind of look through and say, oh, okay, you know, we're looking at this. Is does this look like it's you know scholarly or what? What exactly is the material? Um, so, and if they're faculty that are skeptical, there are generally you can find things that are widely used and anything you know, that you come across and you're like, oh, you know, Professor Jones at Arizona State uses this here. Why don't you look at it? You know, someone at your own institution. And if they're not sure, usually you can just contact Professor Jones and say, hey, you know, I see this, this thing that you created. Where did you come up with this? And, and where is your material from? There are also um, certain groups that work with faculty to um, help with that oversight and peer review. Uh, for example, one of my faculty members uh, who's in public relations, uh, he has been working on an open text and he's been working with the Rebus community um, and they actually have a pilot going um, to sort of guide people through the process of creating um, an academically rigorous open text. Um, so Rebus really has that, I know. Um, they also put out calls for peer reviewers um, so it, I think it depends. I mean, you can always put a Creative Commons license on, you know, anything you create really, um, like slides and so forth. Um, but uh, for those more in-depth, uh, comprehensive texts, um, if you are working with a group or hopefully with an OER lead um, at your campus, that's something that um, there's, there are sources to help with that. Um, one other source I wanted to mention, um, it's not, it's not exactly peer review in the sense of, you know, you have a list of criteria that you're checking something against, but um, the Open Textbook Network, um, which is out of the University of Minnesota, um, they have, they've tried to pull together textbooks in different subject areas, and um, they have, people can leave comments on that. Uh, for example, if they've adopted the textbook, you know, they can say, oh, it's good on this, but maybe not good on this topic. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to mention is that there are professional organizations that have um, worked with certain groups. Like um, one thing I've heard of through a faculty member at Oswego is that uh, the American Psychological Association has worked with a publisher called Cogbooks um, to create an uh, open adaptive learning platform. So I would think you know, if the professional association in that field is giving it the thumbs up, it's probably reliable. Um, you know, it's probably at a certain level of quality. Um, and the, um, I'm aware, it, this is a couple years old, but I remember that I think it's the American Mathematical Society had a list of open textbooks that they've reviewed as well. Um, so that's another way to see if something has uh, been reviewed by subject experts. Okay, thank you. Um, Dave notes in the, the questions, um, the Shakespeare Monologues Project is such an exciting open pedagogy product. Where did students find the OER content for that site? And just out of curiosity, when students were looking for content, did you spend time talking about how students make decisions about expertise authority, um, which I know you covered a little bit, but not quite as much about that project. And then he notes, this is all very wonderful, thorough work. So um, the Shakespearean monologue project, um, all the content, uh, the actual monologues themselves uh, were pulled from, I can't remember the site, I think it's like Open Shakespeare or something. Something, you know, as we know, Shakespeare's works are in the public domain. Um, so I know they pulled the monologues themselves from those sites. Um, and everything, you know, I talked a little bit about the definitions and where they were going with those. Um, and that did involve a little bit of work um, and communication with the professor um, because the students didn't always know the meanings of the word. So they needed, um, you know, together to look at the context and see you know, what was the meaning of that, which of these definitions match. Um, and the Shakespeare's words was found by the professor, so I'm trusting her authority on that. The other ones um, I had found, uh, and they were on the Perseus website, and I believe the Perseus project is, uh, is out of Tufts University. 
they've been around for, I think, longer than Creative Commons, because I remember looking at it many, many, many years ago. Um, but their content is open, and I actually um, had confirmed with them, you know, that those specific volumes were open. Um, let me see if I've answered everything. Um, so everything else was um, basically kind of a written assignment uh, that the students had to do. You know, they actually would like print out the monologue and go through and, you know, underline the parts that needed the emphasis. Um, and uh, the description of the characters and so forth, um, those were generated by the students. And so um, they were reviewed by the professor. And the way we sort of have the workload um, is that uh, LibGuides has this publishing workflow uh, where people can submit something uh, and it goes to a certain group of people who can approve or not approve it. Um, so the professor would get those notifications and have, have a chance to review their work and then comment to them if it was not sufficient. Um, the other thing we did, and I think this is fairly common uh, with open pedagogy projects, is that um, and we actually just started it this past spring semester where um, she had the students actually go in and uh, correct mistakes in previous students uh, work, which uh, I think part of the reason we did that was for the technology to help the students feel a little bit more comfortable with that. Um, but uh, I think it also helped give them an idea of what the professor was looking for. Does that answer your question, Dave? Yeah, we didn't, I don't see anything else from Dave right now, but please do, um, Dave, add to the uh, chat or Q&A if you have other questions. Um, we have another question. Um, what are the incentives you have for your faculty to create OER? Does it count towards their promotion and tenure? Um, I'll jump in with that if you don't mind. Um, Michelle and I were talking about this a little bit. Um, because she's at a community college and uh, I'm at a comprehensive. And um, so I think at Oswego, where I am, the um, expectation of creating materials um, and being under that review for promotion and tenure and considering publication toward it is probably a little bit more common in the comprehensives. Um, we do not currently have um, a college-wide um, policy on OER. Um, as I understand it, um, I know two faculty members who have gone through the promotion and tenure process and, excuse me, I know it involved communicating with their departments and explaining uh, the process and one of them is that uh, public relations professor I was mentioning earlier. Um, I know that when he was putting together his materials, he actually talked to the other professor that I know of um, who was going through tenure and had um, edited a collection of uh, essays on uh, an educational topic. Um, so she gave him some advice. He was also working with Rebus. Um, so they were able to provide some information and some uh, confirmation that it was a rigorous process and it wasn't just something he was, you know, doing on his own. Um, Let's see, I think there was another, oh, incentives, I think, uh, we have for our faculty to create OER. Um, unfortunately, uh, the funding that we got from the state, um, I think we got three years of it, three academic years. Um, and I think the first two years, they were um, funding uh, creation project. And unfortunately, they um, are not <laughs> anymore, basically because of what came down from the state. They um, are more interested in seeing that return um, on investment. So uh, I know that the focus, SUNY OER services has basically been forced to focus more on that adoption than creation. Um, so it's hard to say, I think at this point, incentives, uh, financial incentives maybe would have to come internally, I think. Um, but I do think that um, the higher level courses you get to, um, I think 
it can be a fun learning experience. It doesn't necessarily have to be a financial incentive. Um, like with this theater professor, um, it's for a 300 level theater class called Acting Shakespeare. And, you know, I think the feedback that the professor got was like, I went into this class with hating Shakespeare and now I kind of like it, you know. So um, the engagement payoffs, I think, um, can be really rewarding. So there's that incentive. Um, hopefully that answers your question. Well, and I can add too that um, we were blessed enough at Monroe to have um, funding from the grant initiative uh, for, for a lot of the early development. And then uh, exactly as Laura was saying that um, there was SUNY funding, you know, which has been getting a little smaller and smaller. Um, and that's why we're working now within SUNY having our OER sustainability cohorts because we know that money is not gonna be there forever. I mean, especially with this pandemic that happened, any money, it's just it's not coming down out of your college budget probably um and i'm sure suny will be cutting back you know i mean you have to expect that um i think you're probably not being realistic if you think otherwise um so uh it, it's funny that there are some there's some faculty that are just like i want to do oer i don't care you got money but i don't want it i just i like to do i like the reward when i see the students come in on day one and they're like what i don't have to buy a 250 dollars textbook like they're practically doing a dance in the middle of the class. Like I don't have to spend that money. So there are faculty that look at it as like, wow, this is really an important part of education, right? And with the equity piece and, you know, um, I mean, a feel good moment for sure. And then there are some faculty that as soon as something comes up, yeah, I want to develop, but how much, how much are you gonna pay me? Is there money, you know? So you get it, you want to get paid for your work, but you know, also it, it, it's part of your, your work as an educator, I think as well. Um, you know, if you if you can help someone, why wouldn't you? You know, I, I don't know. But um, and, and also at, at Monroe, I think we're looking at ways that we can include it in the tenure and promotion process so that faculty are recognized for their hard work. Um, I'm not quite sure how that will will happen. But as the, the OER librarian, that's going to be my job to to advocate for that. Um, definitely. Okay, hey, thank you. Uh, right now, I am not seeing any other open questions, either in chat or in the Q&A. So uh, give everybody, anybody have any other questions? One last opportunity. Or everyone's just excited about going to happy hour soon. Yes, they're going to run out with their, hold on, hold up your pint glasses if you got one. <laughs> it's time for happy hour. <laughs> Thank everyone so much for coming. And thank you both for a wonderful presentation. And you can see in the chat, the thanks are rolling in. So Yay. this was excellent. I know I learned a lot and I can't wait to go look at that toolkit. That is really exciting. Thanks, Anne. I know, I hope everyone can use something of it. I'm sure we all will. Yeah. So thank you very much. And I hope everybody can join us at the happy hour. Woo. <laughs>